Welcome, welcome everyone. We still have a few moments before we officially get started. Um, this program is going to be recorded uh, for later uh, distribution on our website. And so if you are somebody who wants to be especially cautious about being seen, I recommend that you keep your cameras off. Hey Candy, glad you made it. Happy New Year. Um, think that we might have it set so that you are completely unable to unmute yourselves. So my apologies on that if you're trying to say something. But excellent. I know we have some people tuning in from Iowa tonight. Glad you made it, Cindy. As well as some regular people. I recognize some junior astronomer names and I recognize some junior astronomer faces. So I'll make sure that you get your punch cards. If you're somebody who is a young person, if you are not an adult quite yet and you would like to be part of the junior astronomer program, um, feel free to give me an, or send me an email, naturalist at ernc.org. I'll put that in the box and um, I can send your family more information about that. Basically, you show up to a junior, to an astronomy program and we keep track of it. And after you reach a certain number, you receive a certificate and a handful of super cool things. But with that, we are right at seven. So again, Happy New Year. Welcome to our first program of 2021. Uh, the Eagle River Nature Center trails are wide open. Right now they're a little bit icy, but as soon as we get some snow, I know that Gus will groom them and they'll be in great shape for cross country skiing. Um, the building remains closed. We're still just meeting online like this. One exciting thing is that um, we've updated our website and there's now an archived programs tab, which makes it even easier to find our record pre or recordings of our pre previous programs. Um, we also have a YouTube channel where we're putting up all sorts of content and staying busy. Um, after tonight, our next program is going to be next Sunday, so not the day after tomorrow, but the Sunday after that, January 17th, on winter bird feeding. At our last bird program, Alicia King, who is an amazing birding author, and she's co-hosted TV shows and all sorts of things, reached out and said that she wanted to get, um, lead a program for us. So that's our next program. Also, this year we are going to move ahead with the Icy River Rampage, our annual right. fat tire bike race, which is really exciting. It's going to look a little bit different where we're not gathering before or after and people are going to have start times, uh, but we still want to keep that going on. Um, we also really appreciate all of you who continue to pay your parking fees. Uh, if you've not been out to the Nature Center lately, we recently got a credit card um, pay station. One thing to keep in mind with that is um, it's going to prompt you for your license plate number, so just keep that in mind. But we really appreciate everything all of our amazing supporters and volunteers are doing to keep us open and going. Uh, with that, though, tonight, uh, this is the first astronomy program of 2021, and we are super fortunate to have Ivan Hodes, who is a former ASD educator and current test administrator for the Department of Defense talking about cultural astronomy. He's given programs before and he's just really great at explaining things. Um, just as far as we're going today, because all of our mics are muted, uh, we're going to ask everybody to use the chat feature. If you're newer to Zoom and haven't used the chat feature before, uh, near the bottom of your screen, if you hover, there should be a little like word bubble that says chat that can pop up a menu that you can zip all the way around. Um, and you can communicate with us that way. You can direct message people uh, like me or Ivan, or you can just ask it to everyone. So we'll be keeping an eye on that today. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ivan. Um, thanks for being here, Ivan. Thank you for having me, Samantha. Um, it's been some time since I've done an astronomy presentation at the center. Um, so I'm excited to get back into that. Um, and I think we're just going to, um, we're just going to get started um, with the program. Um, and I want to start by, by telling a story, a story that might have been told around a campfire that looked um, kind of like this um, by the Blackfoot people um, who live in northern um, 
northern Montana, southern Alberta um, region of North America. And I want to say that this is not my story. This is not my ancestor story. Um, I learned the story from an um, Blackfoot elder named um, named uh, Elden. Yellowhorn, Dr. Eldon Yellowhorn, who is a professor of Indigenous Studies at um, the University of Simon Fraser in Vancouver, home of my beloved Vancouver Canucks. Um, so the story goes like this. The story is about a band of buffalo hunters in the days of long ago who were experiencing some hard times and lean times. And the elders of the tribe um, agreed that after the next buffalo hunt, um, the buffalo calfskin robes, which were the most prized of the robes, should be given um, to the women and the children of the tribe. Um, so that they could survive these these lean times, these hard times. As the tribe prepared for the hunt, they were joined by seven brothers who were strong warriors who hunted well and killed many buffalo. Um, but the brothers, these seven brothers, had not been told um, previously of the decision to give the casket robes to the women and children. Um, so when they found out they weren't getting any robes, they were much aggrieved, um, and they went away from the tribe. They went they went missing. Uh, they went to um, they went to a high place, and they crossed from that high place into the sky country. And they told father son about this complaint. Um, they told father son about the unfair treatment they received from this band. So father son, to punish the 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 band, withheld buffalo from them, and the people went even hungrier, um, hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. And so too were the dogs that um, that followed the 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 band around. And the dogs started um, appealing to Sister Moon. They asked for buffalo to return. So Sister Moon, um, hearing the complaints of the dogs, which I'm sure all of you can imagine, um, and looking down and seeing in what bad shape the people were, took mercy on the people and Buffalo were, was restored. Um, and Buffalo again appeared on land. So that's the story. And I imagine some of you at this point might be wondering, what does this have to do with astronomy? I thought I was here for a lecture about cultural astronomy. And you are. You are here to learn about Buffalo Jumps from Mithras Cult and Polynesian Voyages, an introduction to cultural astronomy. Um, I promise that this story does connect. Um, so I just want everybody to keep that story in the back of your head and remember it because um, we're going to connect back to it at the end of the evening today. Um, so one question you might be asking is, what is cultural astronomy? Cultural astronomy is simply this, the study of how different cultures around the world understand and make use of celestial objects. That seems, um, I think, pretty straightforward, um, but it's perhaps clarifying to talk uh, about a couple things that this is not. So cultural astronomy is not actual astronomy. Astronomy is the scientific study of the stars, of the night sky, of the universe. This is not a physical science. This is not the study of the stars. This is the study of people and how they use stars. That said, um, we are going to need a little bit of basic observational astronomy to understand what's going on here. Um, so we'll get to that, but um, cultural astronomy is a social study. Um, it's a humanity, it's a discipline of anthropology. It's not astrology, um, meaning it's not the study of um, how stars were used to tell the future, to tell fortunes. Um, very many cultures believe that the stars influence um, human destiny. Sad to say, there's no scientific evidence that this is the case. Uh, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. As uh, Shakespeare said, um, that said, um, a lot of what people learned about the night sky through the study of astrology, through trying to make these predictions, did inform their practices. So kind of a, a wide view of cultural astronomy would include the astrologies of different cultures. It's just not what we're going to talk about uh, this evening or what we're going to focus on this evening. It's also not um, what is sometimes called star lore, which is the stories that different cultures tell about night sky objects. Perhaps the most famous um, in Western culture is the man in the moon. Um, and again, sometimes these stories, the stories that um, people tell about the sky does give us some insight into how they use the sky. Um, but the stories themselves aren't really what we're looking at. Uh, we're looking again at that practical use. That said, um, I'll tell you one. So you can say that you heard one star lore, star lore story, which is, um, which is from East Asia. Um, and it is the lovely story of the cowherd and which is this guy and the weaver girl over here, and they fell in love. And for reasons unknown to me, the royal mother of the West, uh, Si Wang Mu, who's a prominent deity in um, Taoism in China, um, for some reason she was unhappy with this match. So she put, um, she put a river in between. Um, she, put them, she put them on opposite sides of the river. But um, 
once a year on the seventh day of the seventh month, um, a bridge of magpies would um, would cross this river and the two um, lovers would be reunited. So the two lovers are the stars Altair and Vega, which are bright stars of the summer sky. Um, the river that they're crossing is the Milky Way. Um, and this is celebrated in a, a fall festival. It's kind of the, I don't know, like, kind of like the Chinese equivalent of Oktoberfest uh, called Shishi. Um, and in, um, in Japan, it's called Tanabata, a local um, Japanese uh, cultural society back in pre-COVID days, used to have a Tanabata festival. Um, so that's the story behind Tanabata. So that's the only star lore that you get. Everything else is about um, the practical use of the night sky. Um, the study of how people make use of celestial objects. But that is also something that might raise questions, like what does that even mean? How can you use celestial objects? Because they're like out in the night sky, they're millions of miles away, you can't touch them. So how can you use them? And there's two ways you can use them. Um, for timekeeping, for telling where you are in the day, where you are in the year, finding your place in time, and for navigation or wayfinding, or orienteering, you might call it, um, finding your location on Earth, where you are um, in the world. Timekeeping, navigation. So to understand how that works, we have to have a little bit of real basic astronomy. Astronomy for school children, I used to teach sixth grade. Um, so hopefully this is at, um, at a level where sixth graders can understand it. Sixth graders or setting the bar even lower, humanities majors like me. Um, so there's four key ideas that I want everybody to understand um, before we start talking about how practical astronomy actually works. Um, and the first and sort of most basic is just the idea of a sphere in general, um, like the planet Earth. The Earth is a sphere, we call it the Earthly sphere, um, and any point in the sphere can be identified with two pieces of information, right? Latitude and longitude. So the Earth, of course, is spinning on its axis. Um, the axis is like an imaginary line that goes through the two poles, um, through the center of the Earth, and the Earth is spinning around that invisible central line. So latitude measures the distance to and from the poles or to and from the equator. Um, in lines that run parallel to the axis of rotation. Line, um, excuse me, perpendicular to, to the axis of rotation. And lines of longitude are perpendicular to lines of latitude, parallel to the axis of rotation, um, and they are moving. So latitude and longitude. We can then take that basic concept um, that you need two pieces of data, two pieces of information to locate anywhere on the surface of a sphere and transfer it to the night sky, which is often called the celestial sphere. So the celestial sphere, um, we now know um, with modern astronomy, we know that it's not actually a sphere. It's an infinite region of space. The stars that we see, um, the planets that we see are all kinds of distances away. Um, some are relatively close. Um, some stars are just a few light years away. Some are hundreds or thousands of light years away. Um, other objects are many, many times further away, like the, like the galaxies and nebulas that we can see. Um, so it's actually a three-dimensional region of space. But for purposes of practical astronomy, we can actually picture it as a sphere. Um, we can picture it as a single sphere, um, some large but finite distance away from the Earth. Um, we are, the Earth is inside of that hollow sphere. The sphere is painted black, and um, there are little dots of light against that black background, and it rotates. Again, we know that the reason it appears to rotate is because it's the Earth that's rotating, um, so you can picture it as the Earth rotating and a person on a given spot on the Earth seeing a different part of the night sky as this rotation happens. Or you can picture it the way that most ancient peoples did, which is that the Earth is standing still, which it seems like it is, um, and the celestial sphere is rotating and we see it move um, east to west over the course of the course of the day, course of the night. Um, and it turns out that for practical purposes, it doesn't actually map. Um, you can picture a stationary Earth a moving celestial sphere, a moving, a stationary celestial sphere, and a moving Earth, it all gets you the same practical results. Um, so the concept, again, is the same. On the surface of the celestial sphere, you have, um, you can locate a star, an object, with a, with just two coordinates. Um, the equivalent of latitude on the celestial sphere is called dec uh, declination, and the equivalent of longitude is called rate ascension. So, again, Declination is the equivalent to latitude, the north-south line lines, and right ascension is equivalent to longitude, the equivalent of east-west lines. Um, 
does anybody have any questions so far? Um, just uh, just uh, uh, let me know in the in the chat. Um, or actually, probably it's, it may be best if you let Samantha know in the chat, and she can um, relay those questions to me. So, Samantha, um, please do feel free to um, to interrupt me um, if somebody has a question, because I really do want to make sure that everybody gets down these astronomy concepts, which are a little abstract, a little esoteric, before we start talking about um, individual cultures and individual stars and stuff like that. So um, to review, earthly sphere has latitude and longitude, celestial sphere spinning around the Earth, um, or appears to spin around the Earth, has declination and right ascension. So the next idea is that your latitude determines your viewpoint. Your view of the night sky is determined by your latitude, not your longitude, your latitude. And the easiest way to remember this or, or think about this is imagine that you are all the way up at the North Pole. Um, there is a somewhat bright star um, that is right at the celestial North Pole. In other words, it has a declination of 90. Um, when you're at the North Pole, your latitude is 90. And Polaris, that North Star, um, is directly overhead. So if you look up, you would see, directly up, you would see Polaris. Or lie on your back, you'd see Polaris. If you were to start walking south, across those ice flows up in the North Pole, Polaris would appear to start getting lower in the sky. Um, and in the special case of Polaris, um, whatever your latitude is, that is how high it is in the sky by angle. So um, when it's directly overhead, perpendicular to the horizon, that's 90 degrees, and you're at 90 degrees north. Here in Anchorage, you're 62 degrees north, um, you're 61 degrees north, and Polaris is 61 degrees high in the sky. Um, for those of you, who live in such um, unfortunate places as Indianapolis, Indiana, at about 40 north. Polaris is 40 degrees um, high in the sky. So the further south you go, Polaris gets lower and lower, and the same is true of all these other stars. Um, when, you're at the, when you're at the equator, Polaris is right on the horizon, um, and you can start seeing stars with southern declinations. When you are in the southern hemisphere, Polaris, because it's so high in the northern sky, can no longer be seen, and you start seeing more and more southern declination stars, stars with a negative declination. So um, when you're up north, you only see stars that have a high declination. When you're near the equator, you kind of see most everything. Um, when you're far south in the southern hemisphere, you only see stars of a high southern declination, like the Southern Cross. Samantha, uh, does anybody have any questions so far? So far, we look like we're doing so good. All right, that yeah. is good to hear. Um, and I just want to, um, I do want to illustrate this. Um, it's easier to, um, it's easier to see um, visually, I think, than just talk about it. So I'm going to stop here for just a second and um, uh, share this um, marvelous application, um, uh, free application. Um, let me just um, change the settings here. Um, this is called Stellarium, and it is a it's a program that basically allows you to um, allows you to um, have a picture of the night sky, um, basically um, anywhere on Earth at any time over the last like few thousand years and couple thousands of years into the future. Um, can everybody see this uh, this night sky app that I've got loaded? Okay. Um, so um, this is what you would see in Seattle right now in the um, unlikely event that you have clear skies over Puget Sound. Um, if you were to look out to your southeast, um, you would see something like this, okay? Um, a familiar constellation to most of us. Orion would be kind of um, midway through the, uh, midway up the, up the southeastern sky. Um, I've got the Hawaiian star names turned on. Um, for reasons that will become clear later. Um, but this is what you would see um, right now in Seattle, Washington. So now I'm gonna change the location and instead of Seattle, we're gonna go to Spokane because who wouldn't wanna go to Spokane? Um, go to Spokane. And you can see um, that it's just a little bit different. Um, Spokane, uh, the reason I picked Spokane is because it's basically at the same latitude as um, Seattle, um, which is about um, 44, um, 44 north or so. Um, so you can see that it's just a little bit different, 
Um, but if we, but that's because it's, it's a different time. Um, because remember that the night sky is in motion. So I'm gonna set it in motion. I'm, I'm gonna run it backwards actually. Um, and I'm going to accelerate it. So it moves kind of fast. Um, so we're gonna go to about an hour earlier. And you can see once I pause it, that now it's basically the same as what you saw in Seattle the hour before. So um, if you're at the same latitude but different longitude, you see the same night sky, you just see it at different times. Um, the most obvious manifestation of that is, of course, uh, sunrise and sunset. You know, um, here in Alaska, um, it is still the middle of the day when the sun is already set in um, in New York um, or in Sp Spokane, for that matter. Okay, so that's um, so this is Spokane at about seven twenty, um, so about an, um, about an hour ago. Um, and now I'm going to go to a city that um, that is at the same longitude as Spokane, but a different latitude. Um, and that is sunny San Diego. So I'm going to load up San Diego, California. And as you can see, um, we're at the exact same time. But can everybody see that the stars are definitely not in the same spots? Of course, they're in the same spots relative to each other, but they're in different spots relative to your viewpoint. Um, and that's because there's a change in latitude. Um, so hopefully that sort of helps everybody visualize that the stars change as you move north and south across the globe. They don't change as you move east and west um, because the Earth is rotating in that direction. Does that make sense? I think it does. So. We're going to move on, um, and I'll go back to you, um, back to the show. Um, so hopefully I've illustrated to everybody's satisfaction that latitude does indeed determine your viewpoint of the night sky. Um, and that is of interest, I think, um, because that means that everybody at about the same latitude sees exactly the same night sky. Take, for example, um, the latitude in the vicinity of 40 degrees north, which is a band of latitude that crosses through some of the most heavily populated um, latitude bands in the world. Um, so starting in the East Coast, um, this is latitude of Pittsburgh. It's the um, latitude of my hometown, Indianapolis. It's latitude of uh, San Francisco. It's the latitude of Tokyo, Japan, Beijing, China, um, Tehran, Iran, um, Rome, Italy, and Madrid, Spain. Um, and that's interesting to me um, because imagine that part of the world in about 800 AD. Okay, so in 800 AD, you had the mound building culture in the American Midwest. You had um, what was then the largest city in the world, um, Chang'an, now called Xi'an, the capital of, of uh, Tang Dynasty, China, um, which had a which had a solar observatory, or had, which had a, a night sky observatory. Uh, mound building people had. Had, a, had observatories. Um, this is a Roman astronomer, um, or Holy Roman Empire astronomer um, from the court of Charlemagne, um, who was in the vicinity at the time. Um, these are the female astronomers, the women astronomers of Heian, Japan. Um, Japan at that time happened to be going through uh, a time when women were highly educated, highly empowered, um, and they produced their own astronomy at the observatories in Heian, Japan. Um, and then this is a fantastic picture of a celestial sphere model at an observatory in Cordoba, Spain, which was the capital of the Muslim Caliphate at the time. And the point is that all of these people making all of these observations of the sky were looking at the exact same sky. Um, so thousands, or not thousands, but, uh, you know, a thousand years before Columbus sailed to North America and the culture of the old world were connected, um, you know, the night sky unified every culture. Um, and I think that's kind of neat. Um, so one other thing about latitude is that it's also what drives the seasonal cycle. The reason for this is that because as we've established latitude determines viewpoint, that includes your viewpoint of the sun. The sun is a star just like any other. It just happens to be a lot closer. And it also happens to be the case that we are revolving around it. And again, depending on your perspective, you can picture it revolving around us. It works the same for these purposes. Um, but the thing about 
the thing about our relationship with the sun is this. Um, the Earth and all the other planets are revolving around the sun in a relatively flat plane, which is called the plane of the ecliptic. And as we've talked about, the Earth is also, also rotating or spinning on its axis. But the axis of rotation is not perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic. It's tilted by about 23 and a half degrees. Um, and that means that it that axial tilt is the reason for the season. At some points during the year, um, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. At other times, it's tilted away, and the southern hemisphere is tilted towards. And that means that as it rotates, um, the sun is in the sky for longer or shorter times. And that effect becomes more and more pronounced the further north that, or the further poleward that you get. Further north or further south, higher latitude, um, there is a bigger change in daylight. Um, so we are all experiencing this right now since we're in the Northern Hemisphere winter. Very depressingly, some might say, short days, um, depressingly long nights. Um, but in a few months, um, we'll pass through the equinox, which means there is equal daylight everywhere in the world. And then we get the very long summer days and the short winter nights, which I'm sure that, uh, the short um, summer nights, I should say, which I'm sure that most of you are looking forward to, although um, you can't ski or stargaze, so I don't know. I don't think it's that great. But it happens, and this is a phenomenon that all of us, especially in Alaska, are, are familiar with. Um, and this is important because it's day the amount of, of daylight, the amount of time that the spot is exposed to sunlight also determines things like temperature and warmth. It causes uh, the changes of the season, uh, the changes in living conditions, which were especially important to um, people who lived in the era before centralized heating, air conditioning, all that stuff, um, when what was going on in the natural world um, with, the, with the elements really, really mattered, and they needed to figure out ways to keep track of those seasons. Three celestial motions that we need to know about. Um, the first one is the daily motion. Contrary to popular belief, the Earth does not um, take 24 hours to spin on its axis. It takes four minutes less than that. 23 hours and 56 minutes. And that's important um, because we don't measure our time that way. We measure it by the 24 hour period. The reason we measure by the 24 hour period is that's because that's how long it takes the sun to um, appear at its, what's called its, um, its uh, noon, the solar noon. It's high, the highest point that it's gonna get in the sky that day. It takes 24 hours to go from noon to noon. Um, the reason it doesn't match with how long the Earth takes to rotate is because during that, that day-long rotation, the Earth has moved just a little bit along its orbital path. Um, it's moved just enough that the Sun is in a slightly different place. Um, and that difference of four minutes happens every day for a year until it gets back to where it started. Um, but because we keep time by the Sun, from our perspective, when it's the same time, when it's nine o'clock at night, um, that means that it's not the sun that is in a slightly different position or the sunset or whatever. Um, it's the stars that appear to be in a different position um, at the same time, 24 hours later. Um, so that comprehends the daily and the yearly motion, um, the gradual change in position of the stars. Um, so again, let me, let me show what that looks like um, because it's, um, it's always easier to visualize these things. I'm going to do another share. I'm going to go back to Stellarium, um, and let's go. Let's go home for this one. Um, let's go to Anchorage right now. Um, so here is Anchorage. I just want to make sure we're at the current time, which we are. Um, so again, here is our old friend Orion looking southeast. Um, very briefly, I'm going to accelerate time. So this is just. Um, the daily rotation happening, okay? Um, so I'm gonna let it run, you know, till midnight or so, um, 11 o'clock. So you can see that the stars are rotating as the night proceeds, right? So let's go back to current time. Um, and now let's go um, same time, but, uh, but a day later. Um, there we go. Okay, so today is the 8th of January. We're going to change it to the 9th of January at the same time. And you can see that there's a very slight shift, right? Next day, more of a shift. So it keeps moving. If we go, if we jump ahead a month, 
that's a very noticeable shift, right? Um, so now let's go back to where we go back to current time. And then we're going to jump ahead exactly one year. Yay, it's 2022. Hopefully things have improved. And you can see that pretty much um, the, the sky is exactly the same. There's a little bit of difference in brightness because of the moon, um, but the stars are in the same position that they were a year ago. And that is in a lot of ways, indeed, the definition of a year, um, which is um, the, the amount of time it takes for the stars to return to the same spot in, in the sky on the same, viewed from the same location at the same time of day. So is everybody good with that? Um, that there are that there's a daily motion of stars and an annual motion of stars. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint um, and talk about the third motion, which is by far the most obscure one. There's actually a bunch of other motions that the Earth does. This is the only one that was noticed by um, by traditional peoples, by indigenous peoples uh, that we know of, um, and that is what's called the um, the Great Year sometimes called the platonic year, and this is um, this is a consequence of a phenomenon called precession. So the Earth, as we've talked about, is spinning, and if you've ever seen a top spinning, you know that the that the that the top of the top, so to speak, um, kind of wobbles. Um, it it um, it makes a circle as it as it moves. Um, so the way to picture this is imagine that the Celestial axis, which we've talked about, extends into space. So the Earth's axis of rotation, imagine it extends into space, and imagine that it has a, has a pencil at the end of it. And that pencil is in contact with the celestial sphere. So over this very long period, almost 26,000 years, that pencil is going to trace a circle in the sky. Um, it's going to start at Polaris. We'll watch the animation again. It's going to start at Polaris. It's going to, in a few thousand years, it's going to be closer to Deneb. After that, um, about halfway through the cycle, it's going to be real close to the bright star Vega. Um, a few thousand years after that, it's not going to be near any bright stars at all. And then in another 25,000 years, it will be back at Polaris. Um, the way that this was perceived by, um, by people on the ground, though, um, was that over very long periods of time, um, the stars that were in the background on a given day of the year did shift. Um, the first people noticed this were the Greeks and the Romans, um, because by by that point there were enough records. Um, there were thousands of years of records from the time of the ancient Babylonians, and these Greek and Roman astronomers started noticing, hey, the Babylonians were saying that these stars were, um, you know, opposite from the sun or at this position in the sky on the equinox, um, but we're seeing that it's these stars. Um, so the phenomenon was originally known as the precession of the equinox because um, it because it, it looked like the stars that were in the sky on the vernal equinox were shifting. And this seemed to have caused a crisis in faith. So we're going to take a quick detour into Roman mystery cults. Um, so there were a lot of kind of odd religions that were going on around the time of the creation of the Roman Empire. We don't know a huge amount about them because they were mysterious. Um, and what that means is they're kind of like Masonic lodges. Um, part of the deal is you can't tell anybody else what happened. They didn't have written records. So we don't know exactly what they believed, but it's possible that the god that they worshipped was called Mithras, was associated with the discovery of the um, of the phenomenon of axial procession. And here's why that may be the case. So the Greeks and the Romans probably believed that the planets that they saw were literal gods. So they literally thought that Jupiter was Jupiter. They literally thought that Venus was Venus. Um, they thought that the sun was Apollo and so forth and so on. Um, and all of these gods were inside of the celestial sphere. So the celestial sphere, which didn't move freely, uh, which only rotated, which as far as they could tell was never changing, um, the celestial sphere was sort of taken as the outer boundary of the universe. Um, that contained everything in the universe, including the gods. Now all of a sudden, they have discovered that there's something moving the celestial sphere. So what could be powerful enough to move the celestial sphere? Something even more powerful than Zeus, a new god. Um, and that god, again, was called Mithras. So this is a bas-relief that is found in almost every Mithraic temple all around the Roman Empire. Wherever the Roman army went, you would find these, um, find these temples and find these bas-reliefs. 
So this guy with the uh, with the cool hat is probably Mithras. He appears to be slaying a bull. Um, and the thought is, again, um, this is called procession of the equinox. So earlier, in earlier times, um, the constellation Taurus was across from the sun at the time of the spring equinox. But because of axial procession, Taurus had moved out of the equinox. So the idea, maybe, is that Mithrith is killing Taurus um, because he's the only one powerful enough to do that and moving the night sky um, forward. Um, so possibly this is a representation of somebody, of a god so powerful that he can move the entire um, night sky. Isn't that cool? Yeah. All right. So um, just a couple more vocabulary terms, and then we're ready to actually start talking about um, individual night sky objects and how they were used by different people. Um, six vocabulary terms, but one of them's old, so it's really only five. So declination, again, is the celestial equivalent of latitude. It's where a star is on the celestial sphere north-southwise. So you can see some examples of declinations. Here's Orion's belt, which are right at the celestial equator. Um, Betelgeuse is at about 10. Positive, Sirius as uh, negative 15, uh, 15 south, you might call it. And then, as we've mentioned, Polaris is at 90 degrees north. The altitude, on the other hand, is the angular height of the, of the star above the horizon. This changes A, over the course of the night, and B, over uh, B depending on your position. Um, so this is a picture from World War II. So here's an example of Western use of the night sky. This uh, naval officer has a... Um, instrument called a sextant, which is used to measure um, measure angle. So if you know a star's declination, and it's well known because you, we've got maps of the whole night sky, and you know its height, um, its altitude, and you know what time it is, which they did in World War II because they had watches and stuff like that, then you can figure out your location. Um, and that was kind of the heart of Western style celestial navigation, figuring out the altitudes of stars um, at certain times, and therefore giving you um, latitude. If you have latitude, and you've got some other information and you've got good timekeeping, you can figure out longitude. So that's basically how Western celestial navigation works. Zenith um, is the point on the celestial sphere that is directly overhead. Um, so if you were to lie on your back and look up, you'd be looking at the zenith of your local night sky. Um, and when a star's declination, which is its location on the celestial sphere, is equal to the local latitude, then it's gonna cross the zenith. So again, picture Polaris directly ahead at the North Pole. Um, here, um, um, or in Hawaii, for example, which we'll talk about in great detail later, um, the star Arcturus is the zenith star. Um, in the southern hemisphere around Tahiti, um, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, is the zenith star. Circumpolar stars are stars that never rise or set. Um, they just trace circles in the night sky. This is time-lapse photography of some stars. This one right at the center is Polaris, which just barely moves because it's almost at the axis. The other stars will appear to rotate around Polaris. The closer they are to Polaris, the smaller the circle appears. The further from Polaris, the further they are. That also means that the higher Polaris is in the sky, the more likely these circles of stars near Polaris are to stay in the sky the whole time. As you get further and further south, these circles start dipping behind the equator, or behind the horizon sometimes. Um, as these guys do um, behind, this is actually Mount Rainier. Um, so those are no longer circumpolar stars. So the further poleward you are, the more circumpolar stars that there are in the sky. When you get down to the equator, nothing's circumpolar. Everything rises, everything sets. And, when you, and then in the middle latitudes, you have a mix. You have some circumpolar stars and some stars that rise and set over the course of the evening. Um, if they rise and set over the course of the evening, that also means they're going to rise and set over the course of the year. Because remember, um, the celestial sphere appears to rotate once. So whatever, once in a day, right? So whatever you can see from your location um, will always be in the night sky, in your local night sky at some point. However, sometimes because of your position relative to the sun, when, when those stars are in the, sky, in the sky, the sun is also in the sky. So the stars are out. You just can't see them because they're too bright. Um, and when that is no longer the case, you can start seeing the stars. That is an important phenomenon um, called heliacal rising. So the heliacal rising is the first appearance of a star in the night sky before the sun comes up in the east in the morning. And the opposite of that 
is the cosmical setting, which is when a star sets in the west before the sun has risen, um, at, which means that um, you can't see it. Um, so in between the heliacal rising and the cosmical setting, you can't see the star, even though it's there, it's just too bright. Um, after the heliacal rising, it's in the night sky until it's cosmical setting. This is maybe the hardest one to um, to picture. So I'm going to show show Stellarium one more uh, one more time. So back to Stellarium. We're going to go now to Cairo, Egypt, and I will explain later why I picked that particular location. Um, we're going to go time wise to late July. So we're going to go to late July and go to, say, the 30th of July. And um, the time is going to be about 4.30, 4.15. That'll do in the morning. Um, and we're going to look directly east. Um, we're, we're going to get ready for the sunrise. So there's Venus. Um, here is Orion. Um, again, a very familiar constellation to us, but kind of looking unfamiliar um, because the latitude is so different. Um, Orion at these latitudes sort of appears to lie on his back. Um, and then I'm going to fast forward time and we're going to watch the sunrise in Cairo, Egypt. Um, so keep your eye on the eastern horizon. Notice that the stars are starting to fade as the sun um, gets closer and closer to coming over the horizon. I'm going to accelerate it just a little bit. And then the disk comes up and it's day, right? Um, so now I'm going to go back to earlier at night. Um, we're going to go to about 420. But now we're going to advance by a few days. We're going to advance to the 5th of August, 4th of August. So now um, watch the eastern horizon again. I'm going to fast forward again. Notice this really bright star that, that's showing up that didn't before. And again, it actually it did rise, but by the time it has risen, um, by the time it's risen um, five days ago, it was too bright. There was too much sunlight to see. So this is a heliacal rising. This is the first time that a star rises in the night sky um, and can still be visible before sunrise. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so that's called a heliacal rising. And it happens at about the same time um, every year, which makes it handy for timekeeping. So I'm gonna share again, go back to our slideshow. And I think that's enough. Um, I think we are ready to um, actually take a look at some, some celestial objects, some sky objects. Um, but I do wanna pause here now that we've done the whole astronomy part of it. Um, just uh, want to check that there are um, that there are no questions, and that everybody has a good understanding of what you see when you look in the night sky. And so again, if you are not familiar with using the chat feature, it would be hover near kind of the bottom of your screen. It's a little word bubble that says chat, and just to make it kind of flash at you, I'm going to say ask questions here. But there has been some great feedback, Ivan, that things are cool but, and yeah, people are excited right? about Stellarium because this is really cool. Yeah, and it's free. Like, what's better? Like, what's better than, a, than an astronomy program? A free astronomy program. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, it's, I think I see a question. Oh, thank you, Beth. Appreciate it. Um, I think we're ready. Um, so let's uh, so let's start start taking a look at some sky objects. Here's a really obvious one. The sun. The sun's a star. The sun's in the sky. Um, as you can imagine, it is universally important to all cultures. The sun is. Every culture. Every culture has has a sun deity or had a sun deity. Um, this is the Yoruba goddess of um, beauty and the sun. Um, this is an Aztec um, sun disk from Mexico. And the sun can be used for both diurnal and annual timekeeping. Um, so diurnal just means daily. Um, so the way that you do um, diurnal timekeeping with the sun is through a device called a um, sundial. And let me just, um, I'm gonna show just a couple couple pictures of uh, sundials 
from around the world. So this first one. Um, first one is probably the oldest known sundial. Um, it's real small um, and from ancient Egypt. Um, this is a Chinese sundial. Um, here is a European sundial. This one is an object in uh, Peru, probably an Incan sundial from the Incan civilization. Um, and th this really fancy looking one is from um, the ancient Sanskrit um, civilization in India. So ba basically the way that works, when the sun is directly overhead, which it gets to in some parts of the world, but not others, not ours, um, but when it's directly overhead, um, or it doesn't cast a shadow. The more directly overhead it is, the less of a shadow it casts. Um, the more on the horizon, the lower in the sky it is, um, the longer the shadow. So by measuring the length of the shadow and the angle, you can make a pretty rough, really, approximation of how much daylight has elapsed um, or how close it is to the local noon when the sun is the highest is the highest it's going to get, and then how much time is remaining until the sunset. So it was a, sort of an early um, timekeeping device. Um, it only is really accurate within, I don't know, a half hour, an hour or so. Um, but it, it, it gave you the basics. Um, annual timekeeping was a little bit more involved. Perhaps the most famous ancient sol uh, solar astronomy solar observatory was Stonehenge, the famous circle of stones on Salisbury Plain in England. Um, so you have these stones arranged in a circle. There are two stones outside of the circle called the heel stone. So on the day of the summer solstice, uh, the sun would rise in the east and its rays would pass in between the heel stone. Um, it would strike this um, center stone in the middle. Um, and that is the way that the Celtic priests who seem to have operated Stonehenge as a solar observatory knew that it was a solstice. And again, um, because the solar calendar is so, is matched with the seasons and the seasons are so important to both um, hunter-gatherer and agricultural societies, um, it tells you when to start planting, how many days till, till you need to plant, stuff like that. Um, so this, um, so the annual um, timekeeping was really important um, considerably more complicated than, than setting up a sundial. Um, so it was often the province of sort of the elite um, educated um, class, the priesthood, um, the scholars, people like that in a society. The ancient uh, Druids, the, the ancient Celts were certainly not the only people who did this. Um, this is a solar observatory in Montana, a uh, Native American solar observatory. This is the one in Gaocheng, China. And this is a cool one. This is at Chaco Canyon, which was a um, center of what is sometimes called the Anasazi or ancestral Puebloan civilization. The way this worked, this was like inside of a cave um, on summer solstice. The, um, the light would pass through a gap in the center in, in the walls um, and be right on the center of this. Uh, it's called the sun dagger or the sun spiral. So on the summer solstice, it's right in the center. Um, on the equinoxes, it's off to the right side. And then on the winter solstice, um, it makes two, um, two rays at the outside of the, of the spiral. Um, so the ancestral Puebloans were also uh, keeping track of the, of the solstice, probably for agricultural purposes, so, when, so they knew when to plant, when to harvest. The moon. Moon is by far the brightest object in the night sky. Obviously, the sun is much brighter. But when the sun's up, it's not night. The moon is by far the brightest object in the night sky. Um, also, pretty much universal, um, universal cultural phenomenon that there were, that every culture had its moon god. This is the ancestral Puebloan moon god, since we were talking about them. Um, the famous Coco Pelli. Um, the moon undergoes a twenty-eight day cycle from full moon to full moon. That can be divided into seven day quarters, which are a week long. Um, so you start with the full moon. In seven days, it is a, it's a half moon. Seven days after that, it's a new moon. Seven days after that, it is, um, it's a half moon, but the other side is what's visible. And then seven days after that, there is a full moon again. So it's a 28 day cycle. Um, and 28 is a lot easier to keep track of than 365. Um, so a lot of ancient peoples, especially ones that were nomadic, that didn't have the wherewithal to build solar observatories and sundials, would use the moon for their annual timekeeping. There's about 13 moons in a solar year. Sadly, um, 28 does not divide evenly into 365. Um, so the lunar calendar and the solar calendar never quite work or never quite match up. So you have to make adjustments from time to time. In literate um, civilizations, for example, in the ancient Hebrew civilization, um, 
they every certain number of years they would have a second adar they called it there was a particular month they would just say we're going to do this this month twice um in pre-literate societies what seems to have happened was they sort of empirically checked against um the solar calendar um they were looking at um what the conditions were and they determined okay you know the salmon are running so it must be the third moon of the year um Oh, the salmon aren't running yet. It's not the third moon. It must be the second moon. So um, as the cal as the lunar calendar would get more and more out of sync, eventually they would just say, oh, we're a month behind or we're a month ahead. Um, we're going to restart from there. And it was and it was fine. Um, it was an empirical kind of moon calendar. Um, and this was really important for what's called the seasonal round. The seasonal round is for um, nomadic societies, especially, um, that used uh, the moon count to time seasonal movements and activities. So, you know, during what we call January, um, but other um, societies we call like the winter moon, um, you know, they, they would be in their um, in their winter camps. This is a, a seasonal round diagram from an Athabascan one from, I think, the interior of Canada. Um, so, you know, in February, they would have a particular caribou migration. Um, March, they would go down to the rivers. And again, they would keep track of this um, uh, by counting how many months, there, how many days had gone by. Um, and then how many months had gone by in the year. Uh, it was probably the oldest astronomical activity. This is a Neolithic antler bone that's, that was carved with these like different um, different little circles and semicircles that appear to um, show phases of the moon. So it may have been used for timekeeping, although I did hear a theory that it may have been used by Neolithic women for keeping track of another important cycle that lasts 28 days. Um, quick word on the planets. Um, there are five of them that are visible to the naked eye, um, meaning five that were known to traditional peoples who didn't have telescopes. That is Mercury, Venus, Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter. Because they are also revolving around the sun, unlike the stars, they don't have a fixed location. Um, in fact, the word planet in Greek means wanderers because they wander against the background of the stars. So that means that Jupiter, for example, you don't really know where it's going to be on any given night. I mean, you do because you can keep track of it, but it moves relative to the stars. So it is not the case that Jupiter is going to be in the same spot one year from today, the way that all the stars are. Um, so the planets appear to wander, um, which means they're not very useful for um, navigation. It is a regular enough motion that they can be used for timekeeping. Um, some calendars were based on planetary cycles rather than, um, rather than solar cycles. Um, the ancient Mayans had like three different calendars, and one of them um, appears to have been based on the Venus cycle, which is like 500 and some years. It takes um, Venus about 500 years to appear in the same place in the sky at the same time on the same day from the same location, um, whereas it only takes the stars one year. Um, so the planets are not especially useful um, in practical astronomy, in cultural astronomy. What was really the most used was what are called the fixed stars. So the fixed stars have this highly regular motion that we've observed, uh, the daily motion and the yearly motion, which makes it really easy to use both for navigation and timekeeping. And again, they don't move relative to each other the way that the planets do. Um, so that was the navigation advantage. Um, the most useful stars are ones that are especially bright or otherwise notable. So let's talk about a couple um, important um, navigation stars. Polaris is without doubt the grand champion of um, navigation stars because it has a feature that no other star currently in the night sky has, which is that it doesn't appear to move. It is fixed. Um, if anybody's curious about this designation, this is called its Bayer designation. It's a way of naming stars based on the constellation they're in. Um, <clears throat> so Polaris is alpha, which means it's the brightest. It uses the Greek alphabet. Uh, Ursi minoris, which means of Ursa minus. So it's the brightest star in the Little Dipper is what that means. Um, and the way that you find it is, is of course, um, by using the pointer stars of the Big Dipper, um, um, Mirac and Dupe, also known as Alpha and Beta Ursa Majoris. Um, and if you follow the line between those two, you get to Polaris, the North Star. Um, the English called it the Load Star, um, which means the Way Star or the Wayfinding Star. Uh, in ancient India, they called it Dhruvatara, which means the fixed star. The Inupiaq people um, of the uh, north, uh, you know, the coastal plain up north called it uh, Nutuituk, the one that does not move. 
Hawaii, in Hawaiian, it's called Hokupa'a, which means fixed star. So you can obviously see that there's a theme. Every culture that had it in their sky knows that this guy um, did not move. Uh, just to dwell a little bit more on the Inupiaq, since um, since they are, you know, the the native culture of um, of at least part of Alaska, um, celestial navigation was really really important to them more so than it was um, for the Athabascan folks um, further down south um, and the southeastern people um, because they were on a tundra. They didn't have a lot of recognizable terrain features to use for land navigation, um, so they had to use the stars. And of course, it was um, dark um, for so long for so much of the year. That, this, that, this, that they got to know the stars really, really well. And celestial navigation was an important part of Inupiaq um, culture because it was so challenging to move from place to place in the winter tundra. Um, here is a cultural group for whom northward movement was very important. Um, African Americans um, or Black Americans um, trying to escape slavery in the United States. Um, north, of course, is the direction of Canada and freedom. Um, so they, um, there was a, a folk song called Follow the Drinking Gourd, the Drinking Gourd being the Big Dipper. Big Dipper would point them to Polaris. Polaris got them north, north got them to Canada. Um, here is an interesting example. Um, also in the Big Dipper, this is the Zeta star, which means the fifth brightest. Um, but it's actually not one star, it's two. Um, it's called Alphor and Mizar, which is a relatively bright star in the handle of the Dipper and a much dimmer um, companion that's real close by. Um, and this was often used as a test of eyesight. Um, supposedly, um, if you could tell the difference, if you could tell that there were two stars in ancient Phoenicia, you had to join their navy as a sailor. I imagine that once the secret is out, people would just pretend not to see it so they wouldn't have to join the navy. But I don't know, maybe they wanted to join the navy. Um, in English, it's called horse and rider. Um, in Sanskrit, it is called Vasistha and Arundhati. And in Sanskrit lore, it's represented as a, as a couple. So here's another star lore thing. So in ancient um, Hindu or even modern Indian civilization, um, these are viewed as husband and wife, um, and they're sort of a symbol of the eternity of marriage. Um, and often during um, Indian religious ceremonies, uh, they will point out um, this star, or these two stars in, in the sky. In Japanese, it was called Jumyoboshi, the lifespan star. This kind of takes a little a bit of a gruesome twist to things. Um, supposedly, um, if you could no longer distinguish Jumyoboshi as two separate stars, that meant your eye eyesight was fading, which meant you were going to die that year. Um, so that is the role that um, Alcor and Mizar played um, in, again, a rare case that's neither navigation nor timekeeping. It's an eyesight thing. Arcturus, um, Alpha Boötis, brightest star in the constellation Boötis. The way that you find this one in the night sky is a slogan called Arc to Arcturus. So the same way that we went this way um, along Merrick and Dupe, along the ladle of the dipper to find Polaris. If you follow the handle, you can see that it kind of curves. And if you imagine that curve sort of continuing to make a circle, that gets you Arcturus. Arcturus is real bright, um, so it's pretty easy to spot um, once you know what to look for. Um, and again, because it's so bright, that makes it useful for navigation. You can pick it out in a crowd. There is an Aboriginal Australian group that gave it the marvelous name Marpian Kirk. And it um, the heliacal rising of Arcturus in Northern Australia happened to coincide apparently with the emergence from, um, from winter of a woodlouse, an insect that, that was an important part of the protein diet of this particular Aboriginal group. So when they saw Arcturus rising in the morning sky for the first time, they knew like, hey, it's time to go, um, to go find our woodlice because they're out, they're, they're out and about now. So that's a, that's a pretty clear example, I think, of how ancient peoples or traditional peoples use these celestial events um, to give them information about what time in the year it was, um, which was important because they had to be at the right places at the right times to take best advantage of these resources. Um, in Hawaii, in Hawaiian, it's called Hokulea, which means the star of gladness. And it's called that because, as we've discussed, it is the zenith star of Hawaii. And we'll talk a little bit later on about why that is so important. Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, Alpha and Gamma, the second and third brightest star in our old friend Orion. Um, Rigel down here being the second brightest. Um, the Inupiaq called it Akutujuk, the two placed far apart. Um, and um, these have their cosmical setting um, in the late spring. Um, so when they started to disappear, um, that was a sign to the Inupiaq that the longer summer days were ahead. Um, 
the, the stars in Ryan's belt uh, were also important to the Inupiaq, um, and they perceived them as three hunters um, who were going after uh, Nanook, uh, polar bear. Um, and then Rigel down here is the fourth hunter who, um, who fell out of the boat, um, and he's called the one who's left behind. That's a little bit of star lore. Sorry, I lied. Uh, I gave you a little bit of star lore in, in addition to your practical astronomy. Um, then, of course, the brightest star in the sky, again, the brighter it is, the more useful it is, because you can pick it out of a crown, is Sirius. So if you follow um, the three men in the boat, or Orion's belt, kind of down and to the left, you come to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Alpha, again, meaning it's the brightest, of Canis Major. Um, so uh, Canis Major is the dog constellation, so Sirius is often called the dog star. In Hawaiian, though, they called it A'a, -a, burning brightly, because it does. Um, Sirius, if you know where to look, you can actually get a little bit of a glimpse of it um, even when the sun has, has started to rise. It is that bright. Um, the Egyptians called it Kahan Sihor or Hasiri and probably thought that it was the literal god Osiris. Again, a lot of ancient peoples seem to have thought that the bright stars were actual um, divine beings, not representations of them, but the actual being himself. Um, and Osiris was the god of the underworld and he was the god of the Nile. So recall that when we looked at the concept of heliacal rising, we used um, Sirius as seen from Cairo as the example. And the heliacal rising of Sirius was of a really supreme importance to the ancient Egyptians because that heliacal rising coincided with the annual flooding of the Nile, which is a very predictable event. Um, and that was basically what their agriculture depended on. So if they knew the date that the Nile was going to flood, they could make plans accordingly. And that is what allowed Egyptian civilization to flourish the Heliacal Rising of Sirius. Um, Rome, which is not too far away, um, and it, at one point actually included Egypt in its empire. Um, in Rome, again, they called this the dog star. Um, so if you ever heard the expression, the dog days of summer, that's what it means. It means after the Heliacal Rising of Sirius. The Hyades um, have their Heliacal Rising in the kind of mid-spring in April. Um, so the English called them, um, called them the April Rainers. Um, and that was, that was an important um, symbol in traditional English culture, that it was time to um, plant the seeds um, so that the seeds could be in the ground um, when the rains came and take advantage of the rains. It also um, shows up in English culture in perhaps my favorite poem, Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson, um, both alone and with those who loved me, on shore and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea. The Hyades, um, by the way, is not just one star, it's a group of stars, um, it's what's called a cluster. And there's an even more prominent and um, dramatic cluster um, nearby. Um, the Hyades are right next to the bright star Aldebaran and Taurus. Also in Taurus is the Pleiades, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but here's one that you we cannot see in Alaska at all because its declination is too low, too southerly, uh, which is the Southern Cross. Um, so it's the four brightest stars in a constellation called Crucis. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta. They don't have um, sort of conventional Arabic-based names like a lot of the bright stars in the Northern Hemisphere do because they weren't known to Arab astronomers or Western astronomers for, um, until hundreds of years later. Um, so they're usually called Acrux, um, Bacrux, and Gacrux. Um, so the Alpha and the Gamma form the long axis of the, of the cross and they point towards the celestial south pole. Um, they don't point right at it, and they're not quite in line, so it's not nearly as good for locating north-south um, in the southern hemisphere as Polaris is for locating north in the northern hemisphere, but it's the best that people who lived deep in the southern hemisphere who couldn't see Polaris could do. Um, and Hawaiian are really Polynesian because um, Hawaii is not in, in the southern hemisphere, although you can see it. Um, you can see gay crux um, from low northern latitudes. But anyway, they called it uh, Hanaya Kamala Mount. Hanaya Kamalama, uh, which means cared for by the moon. I actually don't know why um, they associated these particular stars with the moon, but they did use it for navigation, uh, and we'll get we'll come back to that. So my very favorite, the Pleiades, uh, or Pleiades, um, which is again not one star but a group of stars. Um, some people perceive can see five, some people can see six, some people can see seven, some people say that they can see nine. My eyesight's not that great, so to me it just kind of looks like a silvery smear. Um, but it's really really interesting. Nothing else in the night sky. Um, resembles the Pleiades. It's extremely distinct um, and goes by many names in many cultures. The English called it the Seven Sisters. Apparently English people can see seven. Nupiat called it Kiguyagat, which means the red fox, which they think is great. Um, 
Hawaiian um, people called it makali, which means the little shining ones, because they're little and shiny. And Japanese called it Subaru. So if you've ever seen the logo of the Subaru line of vehicles, it's uh, seven stars, and now you know why. So speaking of Polynesians, we've been mentioning the, um, the Hawaiian names for these. Um, and that's because uh, Hawaiians had an especially rich um, star culture. Um, so when James Cook visited the Pacific in the late 18th century, um, he encountered a mystery. He sailed all over this huge tract of ocean. This doesn't even really give you a sense of the scale. This is like a million square mile long. There's a triangle of um, ocean anchored Hawaii in the north, New Zealand southwest, Easter Island in the southeast, um, and Samoa right in the center, and everything within that, um, or there are all these island groups um, within that. It's called the Polynesian Triangle. Um, and Captain Cook found that um, all the people across these islands, this is again a million square miles of ocean with relatively small islands, except for New Zealand, um, kind of scattered around them. For, um, for comparison, this is like three times the size of the United States, uh, the Polynesian Triangle is. Um, and everywhere he went within the Polynesian Triangle, um, Captain Cook found people who spoke pretty much the same language and had very, very similar cultures, very similar phenotypes, and he recognized um, as a relatively um, observant um, anthropologist by um, European standards, um, he recognized that they were the same people. So his question was, how should we account for this nation spreading itself so far over this vast ocean? And the answer was their system of navigation. How did they get to all these um, islands in the middle of, of uh, the open ocean? They sailed there, um, Polynesian voyaging. So they had these big um, double-hulled canoes that they would um, fill up with people, fill up with pigs, fill up with chickens, fill up with food, with taro root, um, and they go off and literally discover new islands. When, the, when islands became too full, or there was some kind of conflict, or they just wanted to find another island, uh, they would sail off and discover them and establish routes between them. Um, and they were able to figure out um, exactly how to, how to sort of um, recreate these routes reliably every time. Um, so that, that was a system called Polynesian Wayfinding. Um, celestial navigation was only one component of it. They had all kinds of, to me, almost unimaginable methods of um, making their way across this ocean. And I just, um, every time I talk about this, it just, it just blows my mind what an amazing accomplishment this was. Um, the ancient Greeks, you know, they would sail across the Mediterranean, probably never leave sight of land, um, and write, uh, you know, Homer wrote an entire epic about a guy who never left the Mediterranean. Um, these guys went 2,600 miles from Hawaii to Tahiti and back all of the time, and they didn't have compasses, they didn't have maps, they didn't have sextants, all they had was their knowledge of their environment. Um, it is, I think the most remarkable achievement in human, in the history of the species, really, um, that they were able to do this. Um, like, so celestial navigation was only one component of it. Um, they would follow flocks of birds. Um, when the sun rose, they, kn they knew that was east, right? So they would, so the navigator um, would look at the direction that the, that the swells that the ocean was going in and memorize that. And then he would lie in the bottom of the canoe and he would feel the vibrations of, of the waves um, hitting the hull in the bottom of his feet and supposedly in other sensitive portions of the male anatomy um, and and sense if the um, swells were changing direction and then tell the people who were piloting the boat to adjust so that they, that they kept the right heading. Um, they noticed schools of fish. They noticed the color of the ocean. They noticed um, cloud patterns. Uh, there was a whole system to do this. Celestial navigation was only one part of it, but it was in a lot of ways the most important part. The way they did it, was they would memorize what are called star lines. So they would memorize where in the sky a star would rise and set, and they did this for dozens and dozens and dozens of stars. Um, it was memorized through song, passed on orally. The people who did that were sort of, again, um, sort of specialists. It was, it was kind of a guild that was passed from um, generation to generation, a really intensive um, training, and it took years and years and years and years to become a master navigator. This um, is a star line representation from, I believe, the island of Sadawal in the South Pacific. Um, I have no idea how it works, but it represents the motions of um, stars through the sky, and they would use this as a training device so that all of these um, star lines would get memorized. So, how did they actually do it? Let's talk about um, one voyage that 
Um, the archaeological record indicates for sure happened over and over again, which is the voyage from Tahiti to Hawaii and back. So start in Tahiti. Who wouldn't want to leave there? So they leave Tahiti and they would go north. Um, again, Tahiti is in the southern hemisphere. They can't see Polaris. So how do they know where north is? They know that it's the opposite of south. So they put um, the Southern Cross, Haneakamalama, to their stern, and they start heading away from, so to speak, um, they start, start heading away from where the Southern Cross is pointing south. Eventually, um, the Polaris, the North Star, um, Hokupa'a, the fixed star, will rise. They would keep going until it was one hand length above the horizon. So they would make that um, traditional, you know, Hawaiian chaka. Um, and when you extend your arm, um, and extend your thumb and, and pinky like that, um, that covers about 20 degrees of um, angle in the night sky, 20 degrees of, um, 20 degrees of, um, of elevation, right? Um, and like we talked about, Polaris in particular, um, however high it is in the sky degree-wise, that is your latitude. So this is, is about 20 degrees of altitude. Hawaii is at 20 degrees of latitude. So when um, Hokupa'a was that high in the sky, they knew they were in the vicinity of Hawaii. The other way they knew um, was that Hokulea Arcturus was the zenith star. So what the navigator would do, he would lie on his back um, in, um, when the night sky came out, and he would watch the stars as they were coming over. And when Hokulea was directly over him, um, he knew that they were at the latitude of Hawaii. Um, so what they would do, um, Tahiti is pretty much directly south of Hawaii. It's a little off to the east. So they used a technique called aiming off. They would actually sail east a little bit first. So they knew no matter what, they were definitely east of Hawaii. Um, even if they made some errors, they were definitely to the east. Um, so we go east a little bit, then they would go north using the method that I described. Once they knew that they were at the latitude of Hawaii, they would turn their boat west, which means now Polaris is off to their right. Um, and they would, um, they would know that they would hit Hawaii. Hawaii covers a lot of degrees of latitude because it's a big island chain, so it's kind of an area target. Um, and that's how they were able to do it. It's also handy um, with the big island having um, those two very, very tall mountains, um, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. That means you can see it from quite a ways in the distance. So that assisted them in finding their way to the Hawaiian Islands. And of course, the reverse, they would put Hokupa'a to their stern, um, sail south until they could see the Southern Cross. Southern Cross would drive them south. Um, sort of repeating the process. And again, this happened probably hundreds of times um, over the course of centuries um, that they were able to do this. Again, no maps, no compasses, nothing but the knowledge in their head and their observations. Um, let me go ahead and show what that actually looked like. Um, so um, let me go back to Stellarin. Now we're going to go to Tahiti. Yay. We're going to go to Papite, the capital of Tahiti, capital of French Polynesia, I should say. Um, and we're going to change our date to the spring because that's when, um, that's when uh, the voyaging season was. We're going to make sure that we're real late at night so they get, so they get the fully dark night sky. Um, so if we look south, There's the Southern Cross pointing south. Um, so again, they would put that to their to their stern. So the front of the boat was facing north, and they would see something like this. Um, so they would start heading in that direction, and then I'm going just going to adjust the latitude manually now. Um, I'm going to get them up to north. Let's say five degrees. Okay, um, so now, facing north, you can see, oh, let me turn on the, uh, looks like the, the star names went off. The low in the horizon, you have the North Star.
Um, and then again, going just going back south so you can see it, um, when you're at these mid latitudes near the equator, um, you can see, um, you can still see the Southern Cross, so you can see the Southern Cross and the North Star at the same time, which is handy because it gives you a North and a South. So again, that's cared for by the moon. Um, so, so now they had um, Hokupa'a to guide them. Um, low in the sky there. Um, and then they would go further north, all the way up to latitude of Hawaii. So let's put in Honolulu. And there's Hokupa'a, the North Star, um, about 20 degrees above the horizon. And then if we look, I'm sort of tilting it so that we look all the way up. And there is Okulea, the star of gladness, right at the top of the sky. See how I can't, I kind of can't move it any, any further. Um, so that's what they would see directly overhead. Um, so that's when they knew they were in Hawaii. All right. Um, so let me go back to the presentation to wrap this up one more time, because I've come all this way and I still haven't mentioned, um, still haven't mentioned uh, the story that I started with, which is the um, which is the uh, story of the buffalo hunters in on the Great Plains. So we're going to put that all together. So. The Basant were ancient, the ancient buffalo hunters of the plains. They were probably the ancestral people of the Blackfoot or Nitsitapi, uh, Nitsitapi people. Um, again, southern Alberta, southern Saskatchewan, and the Dakotas, um, down around there. Um, they were the first woodlands culture in the region. They had this really um, highly identifiable diagnostic projectile point, and they would use these points to hunt buffalo. Um, and the archaeological record shows that there's this really um, similar or there's this really sudden transition, I should say, in between small-scale hunting of small numbers of buffalo to this really large-scale, almost industrial process of what are called dry lines. So tons of hunters would sort of gather at the top of these cliffs. They would channel the buffalo into the buffalo herds um, into these paths. They would drive the buffalo off the cliff. The most famous of these is Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump in Southern Alberta. If you haven't been, I demand that you go. It's amazing. Um, so the buffalo would fall off the cliff. Their heads would get smashed in, they would die, and then there would be other people um, waiting at the bottom to um, kill any buffalo that had survived, um, and then process um, all of the game, and so they would get really big quantities of meat during these um, during these drives. The issue, the mystery was, there wasn't any change in the projectile technology. They were using the same physical tools um, as they were when they were doing this on a small scale. What had changed was this ability to organize. Um, so the question is, how did they suddenly all know to bring to, how were they suddenly able to bring all of these different bands together from their winter headquarters to the same place at the same time? Um, it required some kind of advance in organization. In other words, some signal um, to start this movement. How did they know? Maybe it was the first, this is a spring phenomenon, so maybe it was the first crocuses. Um, maybe it was um, the snow starting to melt. But that can change from place to place to place. Um, but what doesn't change from place to place to place, as long as they're in generally the same latitude, as we know, is the stars. So what if the logistical signal was astronomical? Let's go talk about the Pleiades again. Again, seven sisters, Kiguigat, Hawaiian, or Makali'i, Subaru. Guess what the Blackfoot called them? The Lost Boys. So remember how the story goes. The Lost Boys go into the sky country, and they complain to the sun, and the um, the sun takes away buffalo. Then the dogs beg to Sister Moon, and she restores the buffalo. Um, so, so the original thought that, that was just sort of the Blackfoot folk, folk tale of why do dogs howl at the moon? It's to ask for buffalo to be returned. But knowing that the Blackfoot called the Pleiades the Lost Boys, Maybe it has to do with this. When the Pleiades, the Lost Boys, are in the sky, there's no buffalo. 
when they're not in the sky, in other words, right after their um, cosmical setting, Buffalo is restored. So it seems to be the case that the cosmical setting of the Lost Boys coincides with calving seasons for the buffalo. So once they were no longer able to see the Pleiades in the sky, that's when they knew it was time to go out of their winter quarters and assemble for these big buffalo hunts. But it gets even more interesting. So remember um, that the phenomenon of axial precession uh, tells us that over very long periods of time, this, um, the stars that are in the sky at a certain point on a certain date gradually change. Um, so that means that the date of the cosmical setting in the Heliacal Rising also gradually change. And it seems to be the case that the, cos that the point in time when the cosmical setting of the Lost Boys started to coincide with um, the beginning of the calving season for Buffalo when these suns took place, um, that coincided with the time when the Descent made this very sudden transition from small-scale hunting to large-scale hunting. So it seems to be the case that they noticed that all of a sudden there was a reliable way to know when to start moving, and they made use of that signal. So I started this whole thing um, near the beginning by saying that the stars do not determine the fates of human societies, but in this case, it looks like they did. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to uh, stop the share um, and uh, open questions so that I can uh, that I can see the uh, see the questions just in the chat box. So, fire away. If you're struggling as well um, with the chat feature, I've just made it so that you guys are able to unmute yourself. Um, we have 13 of us. Just be kind and respectful if you choose to speak, please. Um, Beth asked how I learned all this, and I am glad that you asked that, Beth, because I was going to sort of make the sales pitch. Here's a funny story or confession about me. When I, I was, um, I was a college graduate, I was an infantry officer, meaning theoretically I should know something about how to travel at night. Um, I was living in Alaska, I was 24 or 25 years old, and I didn't know that stars, that stars moved over the course of the night. Um... I was a city kid. Um, I'd never paid that much attention to the night sky. I, I've literally never taken an astronomy class. Pretty much everything I learned about astronomy, I learned at the Eagle River Nature Center when I started going to these programs. So um, especially for the young people, or actually for the older people in the audience, it's never too late to learn. But for the young people, it's better if you start early. <laughs> um, so I started to learn about this um, just through sort of... Um, lectures at the Nature Center. As I mentioned, um, I attended this lecture by um, Eldon Yellowhorn many years ago when he was up at UAA um, to, to speak about Canadian indigenous culture. And I was like, this is the most interesting thing that I've learned in my life. I, mean, I wanna read more. Um, there was another lecturer at UAA who talked about Polynesian voyaging. Um, they actually, um, there's a society in Hawaii that, that has rebuilt these, these canoes in the traditional style and um, they use the traditional techniques and are able to successfully do it. Um, so somebody in the Polynesian Voyaging Society came and gave a talk. Um, so it's really stuff like that. Um, and then uh, there's a book about Polynesian Voyaging in particular called um, Vaca Moana, uh, which I read. So really just going to lectures and reading books. That's how I learned. And you can too. I have a quick question. Yeah. There is so much involved. This is wonderful. There's so much Thank to you. remember. Yeah. And maybe it's more just Samantha. Is this going to be in the archives so that we can go back and look at this over again and learn more? Learn it is. Some, oh, I'm good. to be able to have it posted by Sunday, if not later tonight yet. All right. Um, any more questions? All right. Um, well, thank you again, Samantha, for having me. Thank you to all of you who uh, took time out of your evening to attend and learn. Um, I see there's a question about accessing the, accessing the archive. I'm going to mute myself and let, um, let Samantha handle that one. And I bid all of you good evening. Thank you so much, Ivan. Since we it's available on our website, we've been updating some of our... Um, how our website works and our platforms and everything. And just for fun, for those of you who'd like to stick with it, 
Um, I can show you where it is on our website even. Assuming I can, there it is, okay. I'm gonna just share it with you all. So this is, in case you wanna nurture the Nature Center where you can locate that on our website. But if you scroll over, and of course that share bar is right where I need to be. But if you scroll over to public programs, first you can see all of our upcoming programs. Um, and there are a couple of different ways. If this is too busy for you, you can look at it as a list, you can look at it monthly. But then also under the public programs tab, there's archived programs. And so here um, we'll have some of the more recent programs available, but there's also a link to our YouTube library and that'll give up um, everything that we have available online. Yeah, so even though we're not open to the public, um, Laura, Asta, Gus, Colin, and I are still trying to find ways to access you and make life easier for you. But excellent. With that, thank you again for taking the time. Uh, we hope to see you not the day after tomorrow, but the Sunday after that, January 17th, for winter bird feeding with Alicia King. Um, information for the links for all of that is available on the calendar that I just showed everyone. Um, and thanks again. We'll see you all next time. <laughs>